Section 11 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Ann. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 11. The Singer, by Wilhelm Hauff, Part 4. 8. The reconciliation with her lover seemed to have a more beneficial effect upon the singer than did her medicines. She recovered quickly in the next few days, and was soon well enough to leave her bed, and to receive her sympathizing friends in her boudoir. The chief of police had been waiting for this improvement in her condition to take up the case officially. He was a cautious and capable man, and rumor said that it was not easy for the criminal to escape upon whom his eye had once fallen. Dr. Long had told him the story's history, and he had received still further information from Baron Martineau. The ambassador told him that he had caused the authorities to investigate the life and the business dealings of the Chevalier de Planto. He had not neglected to emphasize the fact that the poor child had been actually sold. Shortly after Giuseppe had left Paris, the house from which she had fled had been closed by the police, and the Baron attributed this action to the information he had given. He also had heard of the Chevalier's death, but believed, as did the police chief, that it was only a blind by means of which he might the more easily continue his nefarious business. For both men had no doubt that it was this man who had attempted to murder the singer. But it would be very difficult to follow the trace of this murderer. All the strangers who had been in B at the time were quite above suspicion. However, they had the handkerchief which had been found in Signor Bianatti's room, and the description of it had been given to all seamstresses and all laundresses who had the care of the garments of strangers in the city. And the chief of police believed that it was very likely the murderer would make a second attempt upon the life of his victim, and that he was probably hiding somewhere in the vicinity. As soon as the patient had begun to recover, the chief of police visited her in company with Dr. Long. The three discussed the steps to be taken, but none seemed to them quite hopeful of results. Giuseppe herself finally made a suggestion which pleased both men very much. "'My dear doctor,' she said, "'has permitted me to go out next week. "'If he does not think it will harm me, "'I might attend the last ball of the carnival "'as my first appearance in public again. "'It would interest me to show myself for the first time "'in the place where my misfortunes began. "'We will take care that it is known throughout the city "'that I am to attend the ball. "'If the Chevalier is still here,' I am firmly convinced that he will attempt to approach me in some disguise. He will be careful not to speak to me, or to betray himself in any way, but I know that he will not give over his attempt upon my life, and I would know him among a thousand. His height, his figure, and above all his eyes, would make him known to me. What do you think of this, gentlemen? The plan is not a bad one, said the chief of police. I am willing to wager that when he hears you are to be at the ball, he will appear there himself, if only to see you again, and to give his anger fresh nourishment. I would recommend that you do not wear a mask. That will enable him to recognize you the more quickly, and the sooner to fall into our trap. I will dress a couple of my strongest men in dominoes, and they shall remain near you the entire evening. At a sign from you they will arrest the old fox. Babette, the signora's maid, had been in the room during this conversation. When she heard that her lady was making plans to discover the murderer or his accomplices, she believed it to be her duty to help as much as she could. She waited for the chief of police as he was leaving the house, and told him that she had confided a circumstance to Dr. Lang, to which he did not seem to attach much importance, although it seemed worthy of notice to her. "'Nothing is unimportant for the police,' answered the director. "'If you know anything, tell me what it is.' "'I believe my signora is too discreet.' and would not tell it herself. But when she had been stabbed and fainted in my arms, her last sigh was, bon now. What? exclaimed the chief of police angrily. And they have not told me of this yet? This is very important. Are you sure you heard aright, bon now? On my honor, replied the girl, laying her hands on her heart, bon now was the name she said, and with such an expression of grief that I believe it must be the name of the murderer. But please, sir, do not betray me. The chief of police believed on principle that no man, however respectable he might be, was too good to commit a crime. Councillor Bolnau, he knew of no one else of this name in the city, 
was known to him as a man of absolute probity and of well-regulated life. But were there not instances of people of just this character discovered later to be secret criminals? Might not this man be in league with the notorious Chevalier de Planto? In such musings he continued on his way, and as he neared Broad Street, it suddenly occurred to him that this was the hour when the councillor was wont to take his morning promenade. The chief decided it was a very good chance to look into the matter a little. As he turned the corner, he saw the councillor coming down the street, bowing to the right and to the left, stopping to chat and laugh every few steps, a picture of cheerfulness and good nature. He might have been about fifty steps from the head of police when he caught sight of him, grew pale, and turned as if about to go down a side street. Suspicious, most suspicious, thought the chief, calling out the other's name as if he had just seen him. The counsellor was the picture of misery. He tried to smile and utter a jovial bonjour, but his eyes rolled uneasily, his knees trembled, and his teeth chattered. Well, well, what a stranger you are! I haven't seen you pass my window for several days. Aren't you well? You are so pale. The chief of police spoke cheerfully, but he glanced sharply at the other's face. Oh, no, it was just a little chill. I haven't been quite well for several days, but I think that I am all right now. Indeed, you have not been well, continued the head of police. I should not have thought it. I seem to remember to have seen you at the last ball in excellent spirits. Yes, indeed, but the very following day I had to go to bed with one of my attacks, but I am quite well again now. Well, in that case you will be certain to attend the coming ball. It is to be the last of the season, and they say it will be unusually brilliant. I hope to meet you there, Councillor, and until then, adieu. 9. I will not fail to be there, called the Councillor, with a very depressed expression. He suspects me, he thought to himself. He has heard that last word before she fainted. They say she is almost well again, but what does that matter to the police authorities when they once suspect you? Could he have been spying upon me? Perhaps they are following me and reporting to him everything that I say or do. Merciful heaven, to think that I should ever have come to be a dangerous individual. Thus reasoned the unfortunate bull now, his fear increasing as he thought over the suspicious question about the next ball. He thinks probably that I would not dare to approach the young lady because of a guilty conscience. But I will go. I will not let him nourish this suspicion. But suppose I really should tremble and become excited when I see her. He would then believe that it was the pangs of remorse. He tortured himself with these questionings for days, trying in vain to nerve himself to face the danger. He ordered a handsome oriental costume, the dress of the Pasha of Yanina. He put it on every day and standing in front of a large mirror, he endeavored to school his features until he should look as if he were quite at home in this new garb. He made a lay figure out of his dressing-gown, and sat it on the sofa. This was to represent Signor Bianetti. He bowed politely before her, and said, I am most delighted to see that you are quite well again. On the third day he had progressed sufficiently to say his lesson without trembling. Then he attempted something still more difficult. He offered the lady a plate with bonbons and punch taking a glass of water to practice on. At first the dishes rattled in his trembling hand, but he soon learned to hold them more steadily, and to remark quite cheerily, My dear Signora, may I not offer you some slight refreshment? He was getting along finely. No mortal man should see him tremble. He was going to the ball, be he ever so fearful. Dr. Long would not yield to anyone else the pleasure of escorting his recovered patient upon her first appearance in public. He accompanied her to the ball, and seemed to feel quite proud of his position as official escort of the beautiful girl who was now an object of great interest to all the townspeople. The inhabitants of B are a strange sort, but perhaps they are not so very different from people elsewhere, after all. In the first days of the exciting affair one could hear nothing but evil said of the singer, from the most aristocratic drawing-rooms down to the meanest beer-gardens but when men of position had taken up the cudgels in her behalf, when leaders of society began to praise her, the tide turned in her favor, and the entire city seemed to look upon it as a cause for public rejoicing that she had recovered again. When she entered the ballroom, the entire company appeared to have been waiting to make her the queen of the occasion. They cheered and clapped at her entrance, crowded about her, and had so much that was complimentary to say to her that there was sufficient for some portion to fall on the head of Dr. Long, who was much praised for having so cleverly brought her out of danger. 
The singer was very happy over all this attention and applause. The joy of it almost made her forget the serious reason for her appearance that evening. But the four sturdily built dominoes who were constantly near her, and the doctor's questions as to whether she had not already caught sight of the chevalier's gray eyes, reminded her of the business of the evening. She herself, and Dr. Lang also, had noticed that a tall, gaunt Turk, in B, they called it the costume of Ali Baba, was apparently endeavoring to approach her and to remain at her side. Whenever the movement of the crowd separated them, he would edge his way up to her again. The singer nudged the doctor and glanced toward the pasha. The doctor followed her glance and said, I have been noticing him for some time. As the Turk approached with hesitating steps, the singer held her escort's arm closer. Now he was quite near. Little gray eyes peeped out from his mask, and a hollow voice said, Honored Signora, I am most delighted to see you once more in full possession of your health. The singer started, trembled, and drew back. This seemed to alarm the man, and he disappeared again in the crowd. Was that he? asked the doctor. Try to be strong. You know how important it is that we should be able to discover him. Do you think it is he? I am not quite certain yet, she answered, but I seem to recognize his eyes. Dr. Long gave the four dominoes the order to watch the pasha sharply. He himself walked on through the hall with his lady, but they had not gone very far before they noticed the Turk evidently following them at a little distance. Dr. Long and his companion stepped to the buffet to take some refreshments. Scarce had they halted when the Turk was at their side. He was holding a plate with a glass of punch and some bonbons on it. His eyes glistened. The glass danced about on the shaking plate. Now he is at her side and holds the plate out to her with the words, My dear Signora, may I not offer you some slight refreshment? The singer looked at him in alarm, pushed back the plate and cried, It is he! It is he! That terrible man! He is trying to poison me! The pasha of Yanina stood perfectly motionless. He seemed to have given up all idea of resistance. Without a word he allowed himself to be led away by the four sturdy dominoes. At the same moment the doctor felt someone pulling at his cloak from behind. He turned and saw the little humpbacked lackey from the Hotel de Portugal standing pale and trembling before him. "'For the love of God, doctor, won't you please come with me to number 53? The devil is just about to fetch the French gentleman.' "'What nonsense is this?' asked the doctor angrily, for he was just about to follow the arrested man to the police station. "'What does it matter to me if the devil fetches him?' "'But please, honor doctor,' cried the little man, almost weeping. "'I thought you might possibly save him. "'Your honor is court physician, and usually goes to the sick people in the hotels.' Dr. Long swallowed a curse, for he saw that he would not be able to avoid this call. He motioned to Bolini, who was standing near them, to put the singer in his charge, and hurried off to the hotel with the little lackey. 10. It was quiet and deserted in the Grand Hotel. Midnight had passed, and the lamps in the halls and on the stairways burned dimly. Dr. Long had an uncanny sensation as he followed the little man upstairs to the solitary invalid. The lackey opened the door, the doctor entered, and almost sank to his knees in his horror. Here lay, or rather sat, in the bed the very same sort of being who had for several days been occupying his waking and sleeping thoughts. It was a tall, gaunt, elderly man with a pointed white nightcap drawn over his forehead. Under the nightcap was a large, sharp nose out of a thin, yellow-brown face. From his color one might have thought the man already dead, had not a pair of piercing gray eyes given him a look of terrifying life. His long, thin fingers were scratching at the bed covering, while he laughed incessantly, a hoarse, frightful laugh. "'Look, he is digging his own grave,' whispered the little lackey, waking the doctor out of his dazed staring at the sick man. It was just thus that he had imagined the Chevalier de Planto would look, this piercing gray eye, these repulsive features, this thin, bony figure, all just as the singer had described him. But then he controlled himself. Had he not just seen the Chevalier arrested, might not another man have gray eyes? And should he be surprised if the sick man was thin and pale? The doctor laughed at himself and stepped to the bedside. But in his long years of practice he had never felt such fear, such repulsion at any sick bed as he did here, when he took the cold, clammy hand in his. "'The stupid fellow!' cried the sick man with a weak, hoarse voice, mingling French, 
bad Italian and broken German together in his speech. This stupid fellow has brought me a doctor, I do believe. You will pardon him, sir. I have never thought much of your art. The only thing that can help me are the baths of Genoa. I have told this little beast to order post-horses for me. I will set out to-night. He'll set out, murmured the little lackey. He'll set out with six coal-black steeds, and it won't be to Genoa he goes. He's going to that place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The doctor saw that there was very little to do here. He recognized the symptoms of approaching death in the sick man's eyes, and in his uneasiness. He contented himself, therefore, with the command to the patient to lie as quiet as possible, and promised him a soothing draught. The sick man laughed grimly. "'Lie quiet,' he answered. "'When I lie still, I can't breathe. I must sit up. I must sit in my carriage. I must get away from here. Dog, have you ordered my horses, and packed my luggage?' "'Oh, dear Lord above,' groaned the little man. "'Here he is, thinking about his luggage.' It'll be a heavy sackful of sins that he takes with him. It wouldn't be possible to tell you all the godless speeches and curses I have heard him utter. The physician took the sick man's hand again. Will you not trust me a little, he said. My art may be able to help you, after all. Your servant tells me that you have an old wound which has opened again. Will you not let me examine it? The sick man complied with grumblings. The physician took off a badly made bandage and found— a stab wound near the heart. Remarkable to relate, the wound was of the same size and character, and almost exactly in the same place as the singer's wound had been. But this is a fresh wound, a stab, cried the doctor, looking at the patient with distrust. Where did you get this wound? You think I stab myself, or that I have been dueling? No, by all the devils. I had a dagger in my breast pocket, and I scratched myself a little in falling downstairs. Scratched himself a little, thought Long. He will die of this wound. He had prepared some lemonade, and held it out to the sick man. The latter seemed to feel refreshed after drinking. He lay still for a few moments. Then, seeing that several drops had fallen on the coverlet, he began to curse and demanded a handkerchief. The lackey ran to a chest, opened it, and brought out a handkerchief. A sudden terrible suspicion arose in Dr. Long's mind. The handkerchief was of the same material and color as the one which had been found in the singer's room. The little servant was about to hand the cloth to the sick man when the latter pushed it away and cried, "'To the devil with you, little beast! How often must I tell you to put eau de hilotrope on it?' The servant took out a little bottle and sprinkled some drops upon the cloth. It was the same perfume that the other handkerchief had exhaled. Dr. Long trembled in every limb. There was no longer any doubt this man here was the would-be murderer of the singer Bianetti, the Chevalier de Planto. It was a helpless and dying man that he saw before him, but the doctor felt as if he might at any moment spring from his bed and clutch at his throat. He could not endure to remain an instant longer in the room with this terrible man. As he took up his hat, the little lackey clutched at his coat and groaned, "'Oh, Your Honor, don't leave me here alone, with him!' I should die of fright if he were to die now and walk about like a ghost in his flannel clothes and his nightcap. For the love of God, don't leave me. The sick man grinned alarmingly and laughed and cursed all together. The fright of the little servant seemed to amuse him. He put one long, thin leg out of the bed and waved his claw-like hands in the air. The doctor could endure it no longer. The madness of the other seemed to pass over into his own soul. He pushed back the little lackey and rushed from the room. Even at the street door below he could still hear the murderer's horrible laugh. The following morning a carriage stopped before the Hotel de Portugal. A veiled lady and two elderly gentlemen dismounted from it and entered the house. It is a strange chance that he should have wounded himself so severely in falling downstairs that he could not flee from the city, and a still stranger chance that it was just you, Lang, that was called to him, remarked one of the gentlemen. "'It was, indeed,' said the veiled lady. "'But did you not think it was also a strange chance about the handkerchiefs? "'One of them he left in my room, "'and then to think that he should have asked for another "'in the very moment that the doctor was with him.' "'That is fate,' said the other gentleman. "'It is as if it were ordained that it should happen so. "'But I had almost forgotten something in all this excitement. "'How about the pasha who was arrested? "'Senora must have been mistaken. "'Did you release him again?' 
Who was the poor devil? Quite to the contrary, said the first gentleman. I am convinced that this man is an accomplice of the murderer. I have had my eye on him for some time. I have ordered him to be brought here. I want to confront him with the villain upstairs. An accomplice? Impossible, cried the lady. Not at all, said the gentleman, with a slight smile. We know a good deal more than we are willing to say just yet. But here we are at number 53. Mademoiselle, will you have the kindness to step in here to number 54 for the time being? Signor Bologna has permitted us to use his room as long as we need it. When I am ready to question you, I will send for you. We need not tell the reader that these three persons were the singer, the doctor, and the head of police. They came to accuse the Chevalier de Planto of an attempt at murder. The chief and the physician entered number 53. The sick man sat up in bed just as the doctor had seen him the night before. In the light of day his features seemed still more haggard, the expression of his eyes still more terrible. He looked at the doctor, and then at his companion, with a glance which seemed already that of a dying man. He seemed trying to find out what all this could mean, for he already had one other visitor in his room, a young attorney with red cheeks and bright eyes. The latter had taken a place at a table, arranged a pile of white paper before him, and held a long pen ready in his hand. Beast! What do these gentlemen wish here? cried the sick man, in a weak voice to his little servant. You know I do not receive visitors. The chief of police stepped to the bed, looked firmly at the sick man, and said with emphasis, Chevalier de Planto. Qui vive? cried the sick man, raising his head in military salute. You are the Chevalier de Planto. The grey eyes gleamed. He threw piercing glances about the room, laughed mockingly, and shook his head as he replied, the Chevalier is long since dead. And who are you? I command you to answer in the name of the king. The dying man laughed. My name is Loyer. Beast, show this gentleman my passport. It will not be necessary. Do you recognize this handkerchief? Why should I not recognize it? You have just taken it from the chair there. But why do you annoy me with these questions? If you will look down at your left hand, said the chief, you will see that you are holding your own handkerchief. This one was found in the house of a certain Giuseppe Bianetti. The sick man threw an angry look at his visitors. He clenched his fists and gnashed his teeth, but he would not speak another word. The chief of police motioned to the doctor. The latter left the room and returned in an instant with the singer, Signor Bologna, and the ambassador, Baron Martineau. Baron Martineau, the chief turned to the ambassador. Do you recognize this man for the person you knew in Paris under the name the Chevalier de Planto? I do, replied the baron, and I am ready to repeat what I have already told the police about him. Giuseppe Bianetti, is this the man who took you from your stepfather's home, who brought you into his house in Paris, and whom you accuse of the attempt to murder you? The singer trembled as she looked on the terrible man, but before she could answer, he himself spared her all further confession. He raised himself still higher in his bed. The top of his woolen nightcap seemed to rise up of itself. His arms were so stiff that he could scarcely move them, but his fingers caught at the air like greedy claws. His voice was scarcely more than a hoarse whisper. "'Are you come to visit me, Zeppa? That is nice of you. I know that you are delighted to see me looking like this. I am sorry, indeed, that I did not reach your heart.' for I would gladly have spared you the pain of seeing your uncle mocked thus by these beasts. "'What more witness do we need?' interrupted the chief. "'Attorney, you will please write out a warrant for the arrest for—' "'What would you do?' cried the doctor. "'Don't you see his death is very near? He will not live half an hour longer. If you have any more questions to ask him, do it at once.' The chief ordered a servant to tell the gendarmes waiting downstairs that they were to bring up their captive— the sick man sank down more and more in his pillows. His eye was breaking, but rage and anger still held it fixed on the trembling girl. Seppa, he whispered again, you have ruined me. It was for that that you deserved death. You have ruined your father. They sent him to prison because he had sold you for money. He employed me to kill you. I regret indeed that my hands trembled. Cursed be these hands that can no longer strike true. The terrible curses which he continued to pour out over himself and Giuseppa were interrupted by new arrivals. 
Two gendarmes brought in a man in Turkish garb, the unfortunate Pasha of Yanina. Under the turban was the utterly miserable face of Councillor Bolnau. The entire company was struck dumb with astonishment at this apparition. The musician Bolini seemed particularly startled. He grew first red, then pale, and turned his head away. Chevalier de Planto, said the chief, do you know this man? The sick man had closed his eyes. He opened them with difficulty and said, Send him to the devil. I never saw him before. The Turk looked at those about him with an expression of utter despair. I knew that it would happen thus, he said with tears in his voice. I have been afraid of this. Mademoiselle Bianetti, how could you bring an innocent man into all this misery? But what is the matter with the gentleman? asked the singer. I do not know him at all. What has he done, sir? The chief answered in great solemnity. Signor, the court of justice knows no partiality. You must know this gentleman. It is considerable now. Your own servant has confessed that when you were stabbed, you called upon his name. The pasha groaned. Yes, indeed, my honest name at such a moment. The singer was much astonished. A deep flush covered her beautiful face. She caught the hand of her lover and exclaimed, Carlo, we must speak now. Yes, sir, I did mention this name, so dear to me, but it was not that gentleman I meant. It, it was... It was I, exclaimed the musician, stepping forward. My name, if my dear father there will allow me, is Carl Bolnau. Carl? Musician? American? cried the Turk, seizing him in his arms. That is the first sensible word you ever said. You have saved me in my hour of need. If this is the case said the chief of police. Then you are free, and our business here is only with the Chevalier de Planto. He turned to the bed, but the physician was already standing there, holding the hand of the murderer in his own. He now laid it gravely back on the coverlet, and closed the staring eyes. He has gone before a higher judge, he said solemnly. They walked softly from the room, and entered the musician's apartment. The singer buried her face on her lover's breast, and her tears, the last she should ever weep over her unfortunate fate, flowed freely. The pasha walked about the group, as if struggling for some important decision. He whispered to the doctor, then approached the young couple. My dearest mademoiselle, he said, I have had much to suffer on your account. As you have uttered my name at such an important moment, I must beg you to take it for your own. You scorn the refreshment I offered you yesterday, but to-day I hope you will not refuse me, when I present to you this musical son of mine, and ask you to marry him. She did not refuse this time, but caught his hand and kissed it fervently. The young musician clasped her in his arms again, and seemed to have quite forgotten his usual tragic pathos. The counsellor took the doctor's hand and said, Would we have thought, Lang, that all this would happen the day you told me to count the windows in the palace, when you said to me, her last word was Bolnau. Well, and what more do you want? replied the physician, laughing. It was all for the best that I told you this circumstance, then. For who knows whether it would have all come about like this, without the singer's last word? End of section 11 And End of the Singer by Wilhelm Hauff